as you are well aware, uh, we have started this uh, series uh, titled Feminist Theory Texts. And the purpose of this particular series is to acquaint you with the uh, ideas, the concrete ideas of thinkers in the, uh, under the trend uh, that started somewhere in the early 20th century. Uh, in fact, uh, there was a background to the uh, trend in the uh, tw early 20th century and that background was in the form of uh, what writers, thinkers, visionaries wrote in the uh, 18th and 19th centuries. So, we thought that it would be useful to start with uh, those theorists in the 18th and 19th centuries who actually uh, formed a basis on which the 20th century uh, theorists could, could launch their campaign on. And uh, therefore, we have here uh, today uh, uh, a thinker and this thinker, this, this woman thinker uh, from Germany. Uh, she started writing in the early 20th century. She was born in the 19th century and uh, she carried the ideas of uh, uh, the latest ideas of the 19th century on her back. Uh, the particular, I, I would not like to, uh, you know, uh, tell any uh, biographical note. Uh, I, I would just uh, say that uh, she is a German, that, that, that she is an activist, unlike uh, her counterparts in the 20th century, and that she is a visionary. And uh, these things, in fact, uh, uh, make her a um, subject of inspiration. She, uh, you know, anticipated certain uh, thought trends that would emerge uh, concretely in the late 20th century and are emerging in fact even now. So, one can say that uh, she is ahead of her times and she said at that time those things which we are realizing to be uh, still more acceptable today. So, we have this uh, a woman thinker called Lily Braun. She is from Germany and uh, uh, <coughs> she, uh, you know, uh, she was born in 1865. She, she died in 1916 a German thinker, activist and visionary as I have said. The essay that I am taking up today uh, for uh, a bit of uh, summarizing and, and, and telling you that, uh, you know, uh, these are the concepts that she uses and, and, and the information that she uh, deploys for making her point clear. The essay that I am taking up and uh, which I will be focusing upon is titled The Female Mind. Now, the moment you think of this title, uh, you are drawn to the idea of uh, a mind which is female. So, is, is that acceptable, this term? Uh, is there a male mind? Is there a female mind? That the two are concrete and, and, and they are distinct and that in, in some respects they differ from each other. So, this is a question I, I pose to myself and this question I also pose to you, whether there is something called the female mind. As you read the essay, it says it's a longish essay slightly, it is about 50 pages. 50 closely printed uh, pages of a large size, but then uh, she is comprehensive and she is very lucid, uh, one of the most lucid thinkers that I have come across. She, she appeals to us not merely at the level of uh, language and ideas, but also at the level of uh, you know emotion and, and the feeling that is embedded in her speech. So, the essay, The Female Mind, this catches our attention. And I think this will uh, ruffle a few feathers even today because uh, many realist feminist thinkers would say that there is nothing like a female mind or a male mind that all human beings are equal, uh, equally equipped uh, from the point of view of gifts of nature and it might be wrong in their opinion to say that uh, you know there is a female mind. But uh, <coughs> uh, our thinker today, uh, Lily Braun, she asserts that there are certain things in the female mind which are not there in the male mind. And uh, she talks about emotions, she talks about sensitivity and sensibility and she talks about motherhood. Motherhood is given only to females, it is not given to males at all. Males belong to the world outside and they always talk about reason. But when it comes to compassion, when it comes to sympathy, when it comes to understanding and sensitivity, then uh, the female. Uh, the human female uh, is able to uh, connect with the, the idea of the uh, emotions better than uh, her male counterparts. So, let us see what she says about the female mind and its this distinct nature. Uh, this will come across uh, to us uh, in the form of insights that she offers in this particular essay uh, called The Female Mind. 
on the basis of the classics she says i am taking this quotation from her on the basis of the classics the arts and sciences of ancient greece and rome awakened to new life in the renaissance so uh, she is saying two things first that uh, there were certain things in classics which were uh, you know, hidden uh, uh, from view for a long long time and nobody knew for instance in the uh, second uh, millennium or uh, t- uh, 10th century 9th uh, uh, 11th century onwards that uh, the greek mind and the roman mind in the ancient period had also come across uh, certain facts uh, which were forgotten by by, uh, the, by the people later and uh, therefore uh, when uh, renaissance occurred in europe uh, in the in the 13th 14th 15th 16th centuries these three or four centuries are in effect the, the renaissance centuries in europe and uh, uh, the the word awakened here is is used very 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 clearly by by the thinker here uh, she uh, let me tell you that she is german thinker and therefore uh, the the essay that i read and that all of us i can read here are in the english translation uh, so greek and rome mind roman mind uh had s- created and constructed certain concepts those concepts were lost to human kind particularly in the in the uh you know uh medieval period and uh, when renaissance came then uh those things were actually taken out they they, they were read they, they, they were uh you know uh, given a, a a proper serious thought and then people realized that a kind of wisdom existed in the ancient period that had been lost to us so uh a new life uh is given to those that that wisdom which uh, you know arose in the in the ancient period so she starts with this idea that uh, the classics c- could be reread in the uh, renaissance period and uh, uh, new ideas could be born out of uh, human beings minds struggling at that time with their problems let's see uh, what what she exactly means by this so i go to the next quotation she says that women to the extent that they belonged to the more affluent classes that is important participated in the intellectual treasures that were being dug up in the virtually inexhaustible plenty so let me first uh, draw your attention to inexhaustible plenty there is lot lot of information in the in the uh, ancient period regarding human behavior uh, regarding human predicament reg- regarding problems that human beings face at the level of ideas at the level of feelings and therefore uh, we will take a long time she says uh, to understand the, the real nature and truth uh, of those ideas and therefore she uses the word inexhaustible plenty there are so many and you 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 have to uh, spend years to really understand the depth of knowledge that the ancients had from there i go to the affluent classes what does she mean by affluent classes uh, well uh, only the educated people uh could be uh you know uh made aware of uh the ideas of the ancient period because they were there in the ancient texts and it required specialized knowledge even uh on on the part of the translators who made uh, those classics available in european languages such as uh french german english uh italian uh, spanish and others and uh, <coughs> well these these people who uh, were learned and and who uh, translated those classics into their respective languages uh, only uh, they could you know uh, make them available to the uh, uh, intelligent uh, reader of of the time and affluent classes had that kind of facility that they could get the books they they, they could you know uh, st- uh, struggle to understand them and they had the time they had the facility to understand the the, the poor masses uh, uh, at that time in the in the villages in the small towns in the suburbs of the large towns they did not have either time or expertise to understand uh, what the classics of the ancient period said and therefore only a few women in each country were able to understand these things and she's talking about women because we are uh, uh, faced uh, faced today with the problem of the awareness of women so only a few women in the, in the medieval period and post medieval period which is the modern period which is the renaissance period uh, that in that period women became aware a few of them in each country and uh, then they knew that, that there was a kind of intellectual treasure uh, lying in the, the languages of of the greeks and romans at that time and that 
that would have to uh, you know uh, consider uh, uh, deeply and earnestly by the modern people by the people in the renaissance period to 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 uh, refigure to to reconfigure their own impressions about life so uh, knowledge at that time is available in the, in the in the renaissance period to a few women and uh, those women belong to the upper classes then we go to the next idea uh, in this essay our image she says of women's intellectual lives up to the threshold of the 19th century would remain incomplete and lacking its essential character if in addition to ordinary women we would not consider the female ruler and the salon lady of 17th and 18th centuries uh, two or three ideas are important here let, let me take them up one by one that she is talking about intellectual lives life generally is social life life or or or, or individual or personal life but what is intellectual life uh, well intellectual life is that uh, you know which involves a person uh, sitting in a corner and reflecting upon uh, the, the ideas that are made available to her and him and since we are talking of women so in fact uh, as women they had no intellectual life but a few women had so that's the difference the difference is that it's not available to women in general but there are a few uh, uh, at that time who had this intellectual life and and they were leading it uh, to the full and uh, she says that uh, 19th century onwards uh, it's a different case altogether but in the 18th century and 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 in the 17th century there were people who had started living uh, uh, you know intellectually uh, who who would have uh, time enough the energy enough the the equipment mental equi- equipment en- enough to read those classics and and to understand from them in the light of, of of the message that was there in them their own particular lives and situations so uh <coughs> let's not straight away then she says jump to the 19th century because then uh, we will not understand uh, which women in the 18th and 17th centuries uh, were actually are uh, making efforts to 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 to, to realize that uh, certain perspectives were important for them as women so the female ruler there were some female rulers you, you know about uh, queens there, there, there has been a queen in the in the, in the 16th century in england there is another queen uh, in in the 18th century and uh, these women they had these ideas you know at 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 the at, at the head of their consideration and then uh, the more important thing is not these female rulers but also the salon lady what is the salon lady uh, you know that there, there, there are beauty parlors today and and there were some kind of parlors uh, in the medieval period also in the renaissance period also and uh, these entertainers uh, uh, the, these you know mistresses uh, the, these people you know who learned arts who who uh, today they would be called you know running the industry of entertainment but in those days uh, they, they, they were active in the salons so they, they would not marry they were uh, extremely beautiful and they had customers they had clients they had friends who visited them regularly in the evenings and uh, uh, felt and 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 got in fact entertained uh, by their company so if there was a, a active person a beautiful woman an intelligent woman in the salon and and she was uh, uh, available at, for, for for the services uh, of of the intellectual and the aesthetic kind uh, to to the gentry Uh, of the period then this person had to read a lot this person had to think a lot this person had to come in uh, come to terms with uh, the intelligent people of the city or uh, where they lived and uh, they were accomplished women so these accomplished women are uh, one should not call them prostitutes they, they were women who didn't marry and who uh, offered entertainment but they also talked and when a woman talks that then then you know it's a different kind of thing that that she does males certainly would not be interested in a large number of aspects of life the way women can be because they have to entertain for entertaining that they, they, they have not to only to look beautiful but, but they have to also say things which are appealing so they created a culture they created ideas they they they, they uh, behaved as women they behaved as women of pleasure they they, they they talked about the erotic feelings of men and women and they and 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 they pleased people by by, by their talk and uh, by by their insights therefore these salon ladies uh, who were extremely cultured they you know started thinking in terms of being women 
because if they are intelligent and if they are, if they are, if they are educated then they would definitely think of their own role in life they they would not be uh, taking commands from anybody because they were in, they, they were independent of the pressures of of matrimony they were uh, in independent from the pressures of of, of the of the of the social kind of the of the neighborhood uh, the, no no gossip could, could ever stop them from thinking and from realizing and in fact uh, if such equipped women uh, start feeling uh, things then their feelings are going to be superior to aesthetically speaking the the, the feelings of uh, the ordinary women uh, in the in the household uh, in, in in the uh, poor sections of the poor and 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 uh, uh, the, the others you know who, who fell uh, under that common category so these salon women these salon ladies and the female rulers they actually uh, started uh, considering the role of women at that point of time now uh, there were not many there, there were not in all cities in, in an equal number uh, they, they were they were not organized in any way they did not have any means to appeal to a large section of society but they, because they were women and 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 they had their own angle to uh, look at things therefore they became a source of knowledge in the 17th and 18th centuries and maybe it is these people who later on had their uh, this presence felt uh, in, in the circles uh, in, in the towns and cities and uh, uh, were also had an approach even to the court and people would sometimes you know uh, spend their time in the evening with them and they were intelligent people these men so they also learned a lot from these women uh, from the woman's angle so males generally would think from their own angle what is the male angle in, in society it's patriarchal it is a superiority they would tell themselves and they would tell others that because they are males so they are they are, they are superior to all, all all the women but when they went to the seren ladies or when they went to the queen herself then they would not say so they would not say i'm i'm superior as a male uh, to, to to the queen uh, he didn't have the courage to do that nobody could could do that they were rulers and therefore the ideas uh, concerning the feelings of the females uh, emanated from these male rulers Uh, female rulers and these seren lady so this tradition had begun in the uh, let's say 17th century this continued the, uh, till the 18th century and later on uh, maybe the knowledge that that they had created uh, with their efforts also uh, reached the ladies of the middle classes in the 19th century so this is the point uh, that that uh, uh, she has made and uh, uh, you can see that uh, she is tracing the development of a uh, woman consciousness uh, in history from some period in time to another and uh, we have uh, talked briefly about the ancient period about the renaissance period about the 17th and 18th centuries when uh, that idea of 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 uh, of, of womanhood started uh, reaching the middle classes in the 19th century the proletarian women's movement which represents not only the mere struggle for the right to work but also the struggle against the mode of work signifies not only a new stage in time but also substantial progress and a deepening of the original women's movement uh, what is important in this particular quotation uh, in, in the essay is movement there was no movement of the, of of the of, of women uh, particularly till the uh early 19th century women had not uh, the uh, wherewithal and they had not the resources to get together as women and and, and could start fighting for their womanly rights <coughs> that was uh, very difficult if not impossible uh, till the end of the 18th century so uh, in the 19th century some kind of movement begins women's movement and uh, the word proletarian is important again proletarian is the worker in fact uh, karl marx uh, used this word extensively in his discussions and he said that uh, uh, there was a class of workers and it could be it could be called working class and that in in the french uh, you know vocabulary the working class could be uh, called proletarian the proletariat the proletariat class so uh, <coughs> the proletariat class the the uh, poor people working in factories working in the fields working in small uh, you know uh, factories in the manufactories in the in, in in the towns these people could mobilize uh, an opinion on their own and when that happened then women also may have got inspired by the collective behavior of the proletariat 
many of the women would have joined the army so so to say of the proletariat if uh, uh, men worked in the factories if men were uh, uh, worked you know in in, in the uh, um, workshops then women would also be working there why you can ask why should women be working when uh, they had they had the household work to do uh, the answer is that uh, uh, the, the world was changing and uh, women uh, had also given the proof that they, they they can work as well as men and some of the employers uh, the the people who ran and owned these factories they would have thought that uh, women could be given less money and they can do equal work so uh, it, there was the kind of exploitation there also but at least women were at that point of time considered good enough to work in the factories outside or away from home so uh, and then they came uh, they, they came in contact with the male workers in the, in the same factories and in the same workshops and therefore the proletarian women uh, was a category that, that that got formed in the early 19th century and then because they were uh, working in the factories and they were together and if in a factory there are 100 women and, and there are there are 1000 uh, men then those 100 women can sit in a corner they can form a group and and they can tell their the, the leaders of the of of the uh, male proletariat that this is what they think and uh, proletarian males would would look at them sympathetically because both of them were workers so as workers they did not find any any difference between uh, the, the, the two categories so that was very educative in the 19th century and uh, well then she says something contentious something that you know we can we can um, uh, look at you know uh, with with some kind of doubt she says that the right to work is important but there is another kind of right uh, th- th- that is forgotten uh, in in the process of uh, knowing uh, what right to work uh, the lacks in uh, worth and that is uh, the struggle against the mode of work what is the word mode of work that people go to the factory they work there for 8 hours 10 hours 12 hours 16 hours sometimes and 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 they do a kind of job which they had never done in life you see you see, you, you you are made to sit uh, in front of in front of a machine in the 19th century and you have to repeat the same work over and over again now this is very very dull this is very boring work uh, at home you know uh, a woman might do 10 20 things but all of them are different and she she might might also start enjoying that work but in the factory she has to repeat the same work which means that they can also then Uh, uh, take uh, a critical note of the mode of work. The mode of work is repetitive. The mode of work is that, 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 uh, that there is no sympathy of of, of 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 anybody else when you are working because that person also is busy. And then there is an employer who is paying you money, and this person is very strict. He, he always uh, has his eye on the watch and also on on uh, his eye on on the amount of work that you have done. So this mode of work is also something that is tiresome. no worker would like to work in the, in the uh, in in the, in the company of uh, the, the the employer at that point of time and therefore uh, it is important that uh, uh, <coughs> these people uh, look critically at the mode of work so the, uh, the right to work yes they want they, they want to work they want to earn money they want to earn dignity through work at the same time they can comment critically about the mode of work the mode of work is wrong they can say and this signifies not only a new stage in time but also substantial progress and a deepening of the original women's movement the women when when they think of the work uh, the, in the in the factory they can sometimes say that some of them have become pregnant and and and, and they would be uh, you know taking time away from uh, the the factory uh, at home Sh- will she be paid for that time this was a question and this, this question arose because uh the, the uh, at the time in, in during pregnancy she could not work during pregnancy women can work at home but in the factory they can't work so the mode of work becomes a question of discussion and consideration at that time and that is a new thing people start this this idea that nobody neither a female nor a male ever faced in life in history in europe uh, till that time but now they would start thinking in the 19th century that uh world is changing and that they have to uh, take stock of the situation in a new way so here uh, i i stop and uh, soon we'll begin uh, to extend the argument further in the next phase of the discussion thank you